All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Candid Coffee, the last one of the year. At least we hope. We'll see how markets and uh, the economy behaves. But uh, today we have special guest Lance Roberts here with Richard Rosso and myself. I'm Danny Ratliff, Certified Financial Planner. Thanks for joining us this morning. I uh, know there's lots of things you guys could be doing, but uh, we're happy to have you guys here. A um, couple housekeeping items. Number one, uh, we'd have to have our disclosures. Uh, RIA advisors, we are doing business as RIA advisors. We are Clarity Financial. Um, we are a registered investment advisor with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, so if you have any questions, you guys need anything throughout this event, please go to the Q&A. We will be answering questions live here. We're going to keep this right at an hour. Be mindful of everybody's time. So, uh, you know, there's no bad questions. We'll try to get to all that we can. If we can't, uh, we'll, we'll get back with you guys uh, and hopefully address during the show or on realinvestmentadvice.com, the blog, or potentially the newsletter. So kind of jump right in. I think, Lance, you know, lots of questions. Been a great year for markets. Uh, portfolios have performed well. But there are a lot of rising concerns and things we had even prior to the pandemic, and certainly some additional ones that we're seeing right now. What's your feeling throughout the end of the year as, you know, we've, we've had this great run-up? Uh, and, and, you know, I know this is a question you get daily, and I know that's why you're laughing, because... You know, I know you have that magic eight ball. Right, exactly. Um, well, no, look, we've had a great run this year. We're up 25% uh, so far year to date. Uh, you know, this is, you know, one of those years that is a bit more on the abnormal side in terms of returns, um, you know, which is a bit surprising, but it's not really surprising. I mean, we're doing $120 billion a month in QE and, you know, all that. So um, real short term over the course of the next two weeks in particular. So, uh, moving into next week, we've got options expiration week. And if you go back through this year, we've had, it seems like the markets have just gone up, but actually they haven't. We've, we've, it's actually been a very kind of choppy stair step on that way higher. And if you go back to, you know, January, February, March, uh, starting there, we've had these regular retests of the 50 day moving average or the 20 day moving average. I know that's a lot of, mum, you know, technical mumbo jumbo, but just, you know, that's kind of that moving average has really been the support for the markets. And ironically, or maybe not ironically, um, every time we've had those tests, they have occurred within the week of options expiration. So if you go back and I've actually got a chart in this weekend's newsletter, which will be going out right after this, uh, th this uh, event. Um, I've actually got a chart in there with lines drawn on every one of these dips and every one of those dips align up with options expiration week. And that is next week. So next Friday is options expiration day. Uh, we have a record number of call options. So the first question is, well, well, Lance, why does that, why does every decline line up with options expiration? Well, if you go, if you go buy a call option and look, there's a lot of investors right now buying speculative call options, betting on the market to just go up. You know, the problem is that somebody has to take the other side of that transaction. So when I write a contract to, to buy certain shares at a certain price on a certain date, that's what an options contract is, somebody has to be on the other side willing to sell those shares on that date, at that time, at that price. And so whenever these contracts are written, there's two parties. Well, as these options, and this is what we, in the, in the business, this is what we call rolling over contracts. So when one contract expires, I've got to open up a new contract. That forces people to sell shares. And so when you have a record number of these options sitting out there, and again, a little bit of a detailed explanation that you probably didn't really want this early in the morning, <laughs> but when these options have to be cleared, uh, that does impute some selling into the markets. And unfortunately, we've had extremely low volume on this entire rally. We've, we've, the volume on this rally has been extremely light. So any additional selling pressure is going to push share prices down. So that's one reason we've seen that repeatedly. Now, so there, there could be some potential risk next week. We'll, we'll kind of pay attention to that. Markets are on the sell signal short term. Um, we are very overbought short term. So there's, there's, there's fuel there for a bit of a correction. Now, right after that, we get into the first two weeks of December, and that is when mutual funds make their annual distributions. And of course, after a big gain this year, a lot of companies are going to have big capital gains. 
they're going to have uh, uh, interest income and dividend income that they have to distribute. And, and this is a, a function of the mutual fund policy process. And they have to do this. So at the end of every year, these distributions are made. And since mutual funds are carrying extremely low levels of cash right now, that means they're going to have to sell something in order to make these distributions. So when they make these distributions, that's going to add some additional selling pressure. Uh, to the markets in the first two weeks of December. And if you go back historically and look at markets, you always kind of have this little sell-off in the first couple of weeks of December. Now, we're not talking about a major correction, so nobody panic and freak out. Um, you know, two, three, four percent well within the context of norms. The good news is this sets everybody up for the Santa Claus rally that happens at the end of the year as all these managers, once they sell to make distributions, have to get repositioned for the end of the year reporting because they can't report at the end of the year having a bunch of cash and not owning you know uh the the, the hot stocks right the facebook's the apples the googles the teslas those those have all got to be on the books so there's that buying right at the end of the year and we'll get that santa claus rally so uh why, why am i trying to tell you all this <laughs> it's because we've probably already seen the highs for the year we'll probably finish up about where we are maybe within a, a point or two uh, a percentage or two of, of where we are either above or below, but we've probably, you know, seen the highs for the year fairly close to it. Um, and as we'll get into kind of later on this discussion, next year may be a very different ballgame altogether. Yeah, that's right. So what do you think the impact is? You talk about the Santa Claus rally of the inflationary push that we're seeing. Obviously, there's supply chain constraints. There's other issues. Is that going to shape the Santa Claus rally in any way? Well, uh, you know, inflation hasn't been a problem for the market so far. Um, yeah. If you take a look at, you know, look, there's 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 lots of cases to be made right now that you know markets should be selling off and that you should be a lot more risk averse than than you probably are right now. Um, but it, that hasn't come to. I mean, look, you take a look at valuations. We're at forty times trailing earnings. That's the second highest level on record back to nineteen ninety nine. In nineteen ninety nine, we were forty four times earnings. So. Any other period of that, you know, valuations are higher. Um, price to sales at three times. We've never been at three times price to sales ever in history. Um, market cap to GDP, which is the market capitalization of the entire stock market versus the economic growth rate, that's two and a half times right now, market cap to GDP, highest level on record. And that's a real important number that people kind of overlook. Think about this for a moment um, when, you're, when you're thinking about the stocks that you own these companies have to generate revenue and the revenue they generate, that's what happens at the top line. That's their, that's the revenue or their sales. And at the bottom line, after they do all of their expenses, pay payroll, pay operating costs, and then, you know, buy back shares and everything else that they're going to do, they wind up with earnings per share, which is very highly manipulated. Uh, Wall Street Journal did a study um, and talked to CFOs around the country of major corporations almost 40% of earnings are fudged uh, in order to make earnings numbers. So there's a lot of manipulation that happens on those bottom line earnings numbers. Revenue at the top line, you really can't mess around with too much. It's just revenue. How, how many dollars did you sell? So the important thing about that when it comes to talking about the economy is economic growth is 70% consumption. Another big chunk of it is business investment, business operations. And so that's what either businesses and corporations are buying, or that's what you and I are buying every day. We're, you know, my wife just went to the store a few minutes ago. She's, she's out buying groceries this morning. So that's, that's us spending stuff. Well, that's, that's where revenue comes from. So if the economy is only growing at 2%, then, and 70% of the of economic growth is consumption, then how can the stock market be trading at two and a half times what the economy can actually generate? And this is why you know, market cap to GDP is Warren Buffett's favorite indicator because it, you know, market cap to GDP can trade at one times. In other words, it can trade equal to economic growth and it should trade equal to economic growth. But when you're trading at one and a half times or two times or two and a half times what the economy can actually generate, there's going to be a problem down the road in terms of sustaining earnings and sustaining, sustaining the rate of growth in the economy. So, you know, these are things that, you know, we know that are out there and they're problematic long term. And these are things that lead to very low rates of return over time, you know, historically with a price to sales ratio of three or a market cap to GDP ratio of two and a half times, you're looking at somewhere between negative two and negative three percent returns over the next 10 years. 
and, and so we know that historically that's the case, but at this moment, nobody cares about inflation. Nobody cares about valuation. It's, it's literally how much money can I get into the market? Because whatever I throw into the market, the market just keeps going up and I'm just printing money. So who cares about the other stuff on the fundamental side? Right. So that so does inflation cause a problem by year end? Do supply chains cause a problem by year end? I doubt it. But again, um, you've got to be very careful here because when it matters, it'll happen and it'll happen and it will matter very quickly once it does. Yep. So you talk about sustaining earnings and kind of the shift in what we're seeing in the economy. What does you know the majority of baby boomers are going to be retired by 2023? What, what type of impact is that going to do, especially when you discuss sustaining the earnings? I mean, how, how is that going to change the, the, uh, the overall landscape? Well, you know, look, baby boomers are going to, they have all the money. So <laughs> when, yeah. when, when they retire, they'll be spending money now. You know, so that's good economically, right? They'll be spending money on their retirement and, you know, buying, you know, their, their multi-billion dollar houses and all these type of things. I, I jest, mind you. Um, yeah. But but the reality is, is there is a problem for the stock market longer term. And, and that is the fact that once these people do move into retirement, they move from being contributors to the market to distributors from the market, which means less capital flows. And if you take a look at the Gen X and the millennials in particular and Gen Zs, uh, even on top of that, take a look at that whole age group, they have more debt than they have income and, and cash. So you know, there's going to be a problem down the road in terms of being able to sustain flows into the markets. Um, but, but again, you know, flows into markets are very light. We have very, very light flows going in. We have a lot of capital coming in from overseas right now. In fact, if you take a look at global inflows into the markets this year, it's over a trillion dollars. And that is about twice as high as any other point in history. And of course, this all comes from the fact that we've been liquefying markets, not just in the U.S. in terms of the Federal Reserve, but central banks in, in the Eurozone, Bank of China, uh, Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan, et cetera. You know, they've just been flooding the markets with liquidity. Of course, that all requires debt to do it. So we keep ratcheting up the amount of debt in the world that we have. And that all suppresses economic growth long term. But, you know, these rates of capital flows are not sustainable. And there is going to be a problem over the course of the next 10 years as economic growth slows and the ability to keep ratcheting up debt becomes much more problematic because the efficacy or the, the efficiency, I should say, of debt translation into growth is weakening. And, and as you notice, it's taking more and more quantitative easing to get less rates of economic growth. And, and a good example is I have a chart I post every now and then. Um, if you go back to 2008 and you look, you, and that's where we started the Bear Stearns bailout, we bailed out Maiden Lane, and then uh, there's a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes a lot of people don't know about, but the Federal Reserve was, was in early 2008, we were starting to bail out a lot of stuff as we were moving into the financial crisis. Of course, Lehman was the ultimate trigger of that. But before we ever started quantitative easing, we were doing HAMP and HARP and TARP and all these other things to try to bail out the economy. So if you combine all these programs together over the course of the last few years, from when we started this, really it was late 2007 till today, we've done $44 trillion of input into the economy from a variety of, of, of programs, quantitative easing, Fed bailouts, bailout, lane, camp, harp, tarp, all these, you know, cash for clunkers, cash for cars, you know, you name it, we've done it. For, now, here are the number, $44 trillion of input into the economy, and the economy has grown by $3.7 trillion over that same time frame. So you're spending roughly eight, uh, almost $11 for every dollar's worth of economic growth is coming from debt. And it's taking more and more debt to create economic growth. And, and this is unsustainable long term, but you know, nobody realized, nobody wants to admit this just yet because right now it's just trying to keep everybody happy. So we keep giving more people more money, but you're not getting the input from it. So it's going to become problematic down the road. It's just a function of when we get there. Yeah. So when we get there, though, I mean, you look at Bank of Japan, you look at some of these other institutions who've done very similar policies, it could be far longer than most people could rationalize, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, John Maynard Keynes, if markets can remain irrational longer, you can remain solvent. That's, that's, the, that's the whole truth of the matter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, lot, lots of moving parts right now, obviously. What do you guys think about, you know, where, where should people focus on putting funds? You know, just a big picture, not like a 
specific fund recommendation or stock per se, but is there anything, especially year end, where people should be tidying up their portfolios? What would you do? Well, look, you know, one thing that we do regularly in our own models um, when we're managing money is just to regularly take some profits. And you know, I, I equate this back to gardening a lot because it's a real simple analogy about portfolio management. You know, if I go into my backyard and I plant a garden, right? So I'll go out there and I till the soil and I, I put down some fertilizer. So, and in, in this term is, or the equation is, is I put cash into an investment account, right? So I've fertilized the soil and I plant my seeds. So I go buy my initial stocks, right? So now I've got this kind of this basic garden built and nothing's really grown yet, but it's there. So in order to make it grow, I've got to keep watering it. So I add some more cash to my portfolio from time to time. And I need a regular savings program into my portfolio. So I'm adding money. Um, that allows me to buy some more shares. And so as my plants begin to grow, you know, I want to keep nurturing that. Well, you know, as I go along down the road, you know, there's certain things that happen with the garden, right? Um, when I get into winter, it's not really a good time to try to grow tomatoes. So, you know, yep. markets have seasons just like everything else does. And there's times that you want to be in basic materials or industrials. There's times that you want to be more financially related or times that you want to have more tech exposure. And so when we have these economic seasons within the markets and we have these market cycles, it's important that we, that we manage our exposure to the, to the market in that regard. And this is, this is a big problem with the whole buy and hold analysis, which is just simply buy an index and write it up and down. It's fine, except you really miss the whole value of managing rotations within the markets. Sometimes it's emerging markets are outperforming. Um, right now, our portfolio is 100% domestic allocated because emerging markets and international have done terrible this year. And in fact, having emerging markets or international in your, in your allocation model, if you're running a diversified allocated portfolio on a buy and hold basis, You've underperformed the market dramatically since 2009 because international and emerging markets have been an anchor on your portfolio for the last 12 years. So there's not been a reason to own those stocks because they're hampering returns over time. The other thing I need to do with my portfolio is I need to pull the weeds, right? If, if, if anybody you know, has ever had a garden, if you don't pay attention to it, the weeds will come. And if you don't pull the weeds out, the, the weeds will eventually take over the entire garden and, and choke out potentially all of, your, all of your plants and you'll lose your garden. And eventually, if you leave it alone long enough, your garden will become essentially a yard again. <laughs> it will go away because the weeds and the grass will take it over. Uh, same thing with the portfolio is that from time to time, you need to go in, you have to sell your losers. And one of the mistakes that investors make regularly is they have a loser in their portfolio and they say, well, you know, as soon as it gets back to even, I'll sell it. Or as soon as it comes back, I'll, I'll sell it. Or, you know, and then when it does come back, they go, well, it, it may keep going up. So they, they don't sell it. And generally, that's just a bounce within a downtrend. You know, if, but if you don't pull those weeds, eventually those laggards will take over your entire portfolio. You'll have a whole portfolio of stuff you're hoping will come back someday, and you've missed out on a lot of opportunity for growth in your portfolio by carrying that dead weight around. So on a regular basis, you go in, things that aren't performing, they've got fundamental issues, et cetera, sell them. You know, one of the things I've always found fascinating about the selling process is that people have this inherent belief that if they sell something, they can never buy it back again, right? You know, so I sold ExxonMobil and, and I lost some money in it. And they, they have this inherent belief that they've been kicked out of the, own, the owning ExxonMobil club or the owning Apple club, and they can never buy the stock back. That's absolutely not true. You know, if, if you buy something and it doesn't work, it doesn't make you a loser. It doesn't make you stupid. It doesn't make you ignorant. It doesn't do any of that. It just says that you bought the stock at the wrong time. You sell it and wait for a better opportunity to put that capital back to work. So weed the garden, so you know, back to our garden analogy, manage your portfolio. Here we're moving into year end. So weed the garden, get rid of your losers. And, and, and most importantly, you know, if your garden is healthy and it's, and it's producing fruit, right? So you've got you know, a fruit tree, you've got some tomato plants, you've got carrots, whatever it is in your garden. If you don't go harvest that bounty, It'll rot and you'll lose it all. And, you know, this is an important thing. So, you know, regularly take profits, harvest that bounty out of the garden, because if you don't, 
you know, you'll wind up losing money. And then this is, this is always the funniest thing that I hear from, from clients and prospects is like, well, you know, I don't want to sell that because I, I, I don't want to pay capital gains tax. Hey, I get it. Capital gains, 20%. You know how, you know, the best way to avoid paying capital gains taxes, turn it back into a loser, then sell it at a loss. That's the best way to never pay capital gains tax. And, you know, but that's not managing money. And so this is the thing that we have to understand is, look, taxes are a benefit of making money. And, and I know we're all trying to minimize taxes. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, Rich, Danny, myself, you know, we're constantly very tax conscious about portfolios. We want to be as tax efficient as possible. But, you know, if we're not, if we're just turning everything back into losses to try to avoid taxes, that's not managing money. And that's not making money. Those are two very different things. So end of the year, harvest, weed fertilize. That's the best thing to do. Perfect. Perfect. So, you know, going to want to really make sure we get to these Q&A questions. Uh, yep. So we're going to bounce around a little bit here sure. uh, from probably topic to topic. But one was you previously referenced beating the benchmark. What is the benchmark? How is it developed? And how does it compare to the S&P 500? And obviously, it's going to depend on the portfolio from a percentage standpoint, but maybe just give some real basic, you know, the sure. foundation of that, Lance. So, so first of all, let me give you this caveat. Um, you should never use a benchmark ever, period, end of story. Um, the reason is, is that a benchmark index requires you to do two things. First of all, it, it, it gives you an artificial unicorn to try to chase. Benchmark indexes, they don't pay taxes, they don't have cash, they don't have uh, any type of distribution requirement. And more importantly, if a company goes bankrupt, they can basically just take it out of the index, put another company in, and the, and the, and the index completely rebalances because it's market cap weight is just based on the price of the stock. In your portfolio, if you're trying to match your, your index, you lose a bunch of money in the stock because it went bankrupt. When you go to buy the new company, you've only got the share, the few dollars you've got left to buy some shares of that new company. You can't rebalance your portfolio unless you stick a whole bunch more cash in it. That's very different in terms of financial outcomes than an index. So what should you use? Your best benchmark index is establishing a hurdle rate. We talk, uh, uh, Richard and Danny talk about this a lot. If your return is to make 6% a year to meet your goals, that is your benchmark. Did I make 6% this year? Awesome. Think about reducing your risk once you hit your benchmark because one year that you're not going to make it, right? You're going to be down 3, 4, 5, 10%, whatever the market is, and you're going to underperform that hurdle rate. But every year that hurdle rate compounds, you've got to make 6%. So this is the important thing about losing money that people don't talk about. And, and, and we go back to buy and hold. You know, I'm going to buy and hold some indexes. I'm just going to ride the markets up and down. That's fine until you lose 10% of your money. Because when you lose 10% in the index, you still have that 6% compound rate of return that you're trying to achieve, that hurdle rate. So now not only do you have to make up the 10%, you've also got to make up the 6% you didn't get last year, plus the 6% for this year. So now you've got to make up 22%. And to make up 22% on the upside, you've actually got to have a return of near 30% to make up the 22 So it compounds very quickly in the wrong direction when you lose money. So now, specifically to your question about indexes, that was, that was kind of a long-winded answer. But indexes are something that we want to compete against, right? It's because everybody has a need to compete. Investing isn't a competition, but for some reason we have this need to compete against some index. So it's important to say, to have a benchmark index that is relative to however you're allocated. So if you're 20% stocks and 80% bonds, you don't want to be using the S&P 500 as your benchmark index because it'll just, there's no relationship, there's no correlation. So for us, we use a 60-40 allocation in all of our portfolios. So our benchmark is a relevant 60-40 allocation, the, the S&P 500 and the AG, which is the corporate kind of general bond index that everybody uses. So, so again, it's just important that whatever benchmark you're using, it is relative to the allocation of your portfolio. And the allocation of your portfolio should be based upon how much risk you're willing to take to try to, to reach that goal that you're looking for. And, and again, stocks don't have a duration. They have an infinite duration. So if your timeline to retirement is 10 years and you have an infinite duration portfolio of stocks, 
you're running a huge risk of there being a crash somewhere in there that, that, that completely derails your entire retirement plan. So it's important to make sure that you're navigating that risk accordingly by adjusting your, your portfolio allocation model to create lower volatility and to align the duration of the portfolio relative to the duration of your investment time horizon. And that's really where the math comes into managing your money. Oh, and I think it's really important to understand as well how we manage money is probably much different than most in the sense that you could have a 60-40 portfolio, which this year has been, you know, over 70% allocated to equities. And mm -hmm. we've had, you know, much less at different times. In fact, you know, taking profits prior to the September drop uh, was beneficial, able to buy some things, having some cash available. So I think those are things that are really important. But you did hit on something that I don't, I'm not sure most people really understand, and that's the hurdle rate. And, and Rich, can you maybe just dive in a two-minute uh, dissertation on the hurdle rate and why that's so important to, to an individual? Well, it's personal to you. It's like flesh and blood because the, as Lance talks about, and we talk about Danny, a personal rate of return or hurdle rate is how much, what kind of return do I need to hit my goals? Very specific needs, wants, and wishes. Now, I may have a big ego, so I want to beat the S&P 500 and that's fine. Like our stocks are being S&P 500 this year, but that's not the big thing. The big thing is if I have a hurdle rate uh, that I need to hit three, 4% on my portfolio and my portfolio is up 14%, well, I front loaded, loaded a lot of returns. And to Lance's point, maybe I'm future funding some goals, right? I, I'm pushing some of the goals I was going to fund in the future into the present. So the personal rate of return is created for you, by you, with us in a financial plan. Because when you focus on an index, you don't look at the risk it takes to get the return. When you focus on your personal rate of return, that is your personal benchmark that you need to hit to make sure you're hitting the milestone. That is much, much more uh, important, Danny, than the S&P. I tell people all the time, listen, you want to have a stock portfolio outside of managed money and own crypto and everything else and try to beat the S&P. And so you have something to talk about at a you know, at, at, at a cocktail party, great. But for the most part, your personal rate is based on your plan. Now, Danny, you know, like Lance brought up 6%. So sometimes we'll get people that need a required return of 10%. And we know with valuations the way they are, that in the future, we may not be getting 10%. So some part of that personal rate of return is you, how much money you save, can you work longer, right? How are you managing debt? All go into this personal rate of return. So that's what we get people to focus on. That's what clients focus on. And that's what we do with our plan. You know, I think with the, the market, what it's done here recently, obviously the Fed's been there to, to provide that backdrop or security, that safety net, uh, people feeling a little bit bulletproof. So what about margin debt, you know, re relative to historical norms? Isn't that relatively high at the moment? And what could be the overall impact of that? Should we see, you know, it, you know a little drop could be much bigger in the long term because of that, right? Well, a couple of things there. First of all, uh, margin debt is is just off an all time record, which is you know a record that is well beyond the peak of, or it's, it's twice the level of what we saw in 1999. So you know the amount of margin debt that is in the markets is basically fuel for a correction. And you know if you think about a can of gasoline as a good example, I I use a lot of very simple analogies to try to you know make these a little easier to understand. If I have a can of gasoline, I can set it in my garage and you know there's no problem with it as long as I don't set it next to the hot water heater, obviously. But you know, as long as I have a can of gasoline in my garage, it's not a problem. As long as it's in a can that's sealed, it's stored safely, you know, there's no problem. You know, gas is inert uh, until you insert some type of catalyst. So in other words, if I drop a, a match inside the gasoline can, I've got a problem. So it's, that's what margin debt is. Margin debt is inert. Um, it actually benefits the markets on the way up because it adds buying power to the market. In other words, I've got a $100,000 portfolio. I can borrow $50,000 against my $100,000 stock portfolio. So now I can own $150,000 worth of stock. So now I own a bunch of Riot blockchain and you know, um, you know, Tesla and, and you, know, all, all, you know, all the other hot stocks right now, the AMC and GameStop, right? So I'm just you know, I'm buying all the hot stocks. So now I've got $150,000 worth of buying power to buy these stocks. Well, that fuels the whole market to go up 
because we're adding leverage to the system. So as long as the prices are going up, it's fine. The problem is when the market declines because the way margin works, and, and a lot of people jump into margin because they just think it's free money, right? I was like, I can borrow $50,000 to get my account. Oh, great. Okay, give it to me. The problem is, is that it's based upon the underlying value of the, uh, of the portfolio. So in other words, on a, on a $100,000 stock portfolio, I can borrow 50% of the value of the portfolio. So if the, if the $100,000 portfolio falls to $90,000, well, now I can only borrow 50% of that, which is $45,000. So in order to, to make that margin work, when prices begin to fall, I get a call from the broker dealer says, hey, you need to either put some more cash in the account or you're going to have to sell some of your positions today. And if you don't do it today, we'll do it for you. And this is the thing about margin that people don't understand. It's not at the investor's discretion. It's at the broker dealer's discretion that provided you the margin line. And they can liquidate your account anytime they want to get their margin back. And when they become worried, about a, a sharp decline in the markets, you will get a margin call. This is what happened back in March of 2020. If you go back to March of 2020, the, the, the market peaked in late February and started selling off slightly. And, and the pandemic was coming and nobody was really worried about it. And then in March, we started talking about shutting down the economy and the stock started, uh, the market started dropping fairly rapidly. We we're having the Dow down a thousand points one day and then down 2000 the next day. Well, about a week into it was when the margin call started coming. And that's why in three weeks, you had a 35% decline in the market. That was margin being unwound at that point. And we only slightly unwound margin at that point. We had a 35% decline. If we ever revert margin debt levels back to norms, you know, you'll be at a 50, 60% decline in the markets within a matter of, uh, of a month or two months. It'll be very, very rapid. And, and, this, and this is problematic because we've now moved a lot of people into buying passive ETFs and they're sitting on these ETFs. And what people don't understand about ETFs is that if I have an ETF that owns Apple, when people start selling Apple and the price of Apple goes down, then people start selling the ETF. The ETF goes down in value, but when the ETF has to be liquidated, they have to sell all the shares of Apple they own, which puts more pressure on Apple, which liquidates more of the ETF shares and it just starts spiraling on itself. And then you add margin debt on top of this and you've got the ability, you have the structure in the markets now because so many people have moved money into ETFs and so many people have moved money into margin that you have a real catalyst here. You, you don't have a gas can anymore. You've got a tanker truck um, of gas that you know is just waiting the right catalyst. I'm not trying to scare anybody and say this is gonna happen tomorrow. I just need you to realize that we're not going to have bear markets that last 12, 18, 24 months anymore. These bear markets are going to last six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and it'll be so fast. You will have no chance to get out of the markets. If you're not getting out of the market before it, it, before it declines, you'll have no chance to get out of it by the time it does decline. Harry Dent's been out and, he, and he's been getting louder and louder as far as what yeah. his forecast is. And I'm going to, I may answer this and move on a little bit here because one thing I can say about Harry Dent several years ago was, he was on CNBC and he had his typical bearish call and the, the host finally said Harry you have been on this 28 times over the last three years and every single time you said the exact same thing yeah and and Harry is is known for being a bear um mm -hmm. you know he's talking now about concerns about FDIC or CIPIC insurance and, and one of the things that I want to go back to is, is personally went through this experience a large institution that bought another large institution when they went under. Shareholders, now, if you own the stock, they were in trouble. But if you had deposits there, if you had investment accounts there, they simply changed hands. It's simply your statement changed. Now, FDIC insurance, is Harry saying that there's not enough money in the world for them to cover all these banks and all the money that's out there? Yeah, that's absolutely right. But FDIC and CIPIC and some of these other guarantee funds that are out there are designed not necessarily just to to sit there and, and provide if everything goes under to prop it all up, what they're there for is to broker a deal with another institution and make sure that you're going to remain whole in that aspect. Right. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, so I do want to move on. And, and, real quick. And, and, and the government will bail out CIPIC and SI, uh, FDIC as well. Well, correct. And so there would have to be a major contagion factor, which is why they propped up AIG, which is why they propped up uh, the auto manufacturers, all those others in the past, yeah. and will continue to do so, you know, as we've seen. Now, 
opinion on you knew this one was coming lance <laughs> oil gold crypto yeah. yeah so oil prices um so about uh in august as oil prices were kind of you know running straight up we wrote an article talking about why oil would likely peak in the short term oil prices were very extended we're getting a pullback in those oil prices now um there's actually going to be a pretty good buying opportunity coming up we're not quite there yet but uh oil prices will probably wind up going higher into next year and and no, it's not going to be a straight trip. Obviously, you're going to see a lot of volatility in oil prices. Oil commodity prices are always very, always very volatile. One thing weighing on oil prices currently is a stronger dollar. So the dollar has been rallying. That was one of our calls very early this year. Um, back in January, February, the kind of the mainstream media was, uh, you know, the dollar is about to die. It's just going to, you know, keep going down forever. I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, look for a stronger dollar this year. That's happening. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with ultra low interest rates in the rest of the world versus what's happening here and money is gravitating. And again, global inflows are gravitating into U.S. equities. And when, and, and, and when foreign currency comes into the U.S., it has to be converted into U.S. dollars. And so it goes into treasuries first. So that's been su supplying a lot of this. And when, it get, when that money gets converted into U.S. dollars, that obviously supports the U.S. dollar. So that was why our call was for a higher dollar. So, but, uh, but a stronger dollar weakens oil prices near term because it makes it more expensive for commodities overseas. So you reduce demand a little bit. But you know, with this whole idea, we're going to try to change the entire economy into electric batteries. And we're all, we all hate oil companies now, so we've got to get rid of oil companies. Um, that's going to prove to be very fatal to the U.S. economy down the road. And the, the, con the contraction of production of oil um, you know, from oil pipelines, et cetera, getting shut down, et cetera, that's going to lead to a very, you know, we, we, we were talking about peak oil back in 2008, um, and we were like $130, $140 a barrel. We didn't actually have peak oil back then. Um, well, there was plenty of oil there, and we just needed a new way to find it, and that's when we developed shell oil, and all of a sudden, we when no longer were talking about peak oil, we had plenty of production. So, the problem is now is that we're now starting to try to shut down and move away from the, the cheapest, most efficient form of energy production in the U.S. And what everybody forgets, look, I, I'm, I'm all for, you know, fixing the climate. So, you know, if there's anybody here that's, you know, pro climate change, hey, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think we should do everything we can to, to preserve our environment. The, the problem is, is that what people forget about electric vehicles and windmills and, and all these other things is about 95% of it is made out of petroleum products. So, you know, and, and, and the other stuff in there, the, you know, the copper and everything else that's, that's required in there requires a massive amount of electricity and energy to, to mine copper is a good example for all the copper wiring, all the connections, everything else very, very energy consumptive. And the cheapest, most efficient form of energy is either coal or oil. And, and for all the byproducts, the plastic, the rubber, the, the casings, everything else that goes into building a Tesla as an example, which is primarily rubber and plastic, it requires a huge amount of petroleum products. So you're crimping off you know, everybody looks at, at, at oil as, as a very finite factor. And they're saying, well, that's, you know, they're, they're thinking about in terms of gasoline, right? Just what do we put into a car? They don't think about all the byproducts, everything, you know, look, we're all sitting around this morning, we're all on a laptop or a phone or something else. We're all drinking coffee out of a coffee mug or whatever we're doing. You got a robe on, you know, whatever you got going on, it's all made out of petroleum products in some shape, form, or fashion, either from the transportation to get it there, the manufacturing, or the product itself, there's oil involved. And so the, the reduction of, uh, of production of oil is going to be very problematic down the road. And, and how we resolve that issue ultimately is I don't have an answer for, but that's going to be it. Uh, um, so it was oil, it was, which was the other one, Bitcoin and what else? Oil, gold, and Bitcoin. Gold, gold okay. Um, gold is trying to break out. We're actually looking to add some gold to our portfolio here. It's very overbought short term, three standard deviations above the moving average, doesn't usually last long here. But I do think there's an opportunity to own gold near term. Um, you know, gold should respond to inflation. What gold responds to the best is negative real rates. And, and so if negative real rates, which is the interest rate less inflation, continues to, to, to get lower, um, and that will probably happen. 
and I'll explain to you why real quick, but gold prices should start going up. So we've been in a very big consolidated downtrend for here for quite a while in gold. It's not been a good performer. It's been underperforming the market by a large margin this year. So we've been out of gold now for, uh, well, since last year, we owned some gold last year, I think was the last time we had gold in our portfolio. We've been out of it this year because of lack of performance, but I think there's an opportunity coming up. We're not there yet, but I think probably within the next month or so, we may get a good buying opportunity for gold. Now, trade in the short term um, could be an investment longer term. And, and let me say something real quick about that. It's important. Never buy a position in your portfolio going, I'm a long-term investor. Never buy a position saying, I'm going to buy this because I'm going to hold it for the next 20 years. That's a terrible way to invest money. And that, whenever you buy something, whatever you buy initially is a trade. If it works, and this goes back to our gardening metaphor, you, you buy something and it works, your thesis plays out, right? I, I bought gold, it's going up. I've got a nice spread between my cost basis and the current price. I can afford to have it pull back a little bit and I'm still not losing money. That is when you can start saying, okay, now I'm going to give it some room to, to, to grow, right? But if I buy something and immediately I'm losing money, it means you bought it wrong. Sell it, move on, come back to it later when the price stabilizes. So everything you buy as a trade to start with, it should have a very short leash. And then once it proves out that your thesis is correct, then you can give it room to run. And you know, it, it's a good example of that. Uh, we bought Albemarle on our portfolio sometime earlier this year or last year. I can't remember exactly when we put it in. But immediately when I bought the stock, I was getting all these emails from people going, why are you buying such an overvalued company? It's ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, it is. But they're the world's largest producer of lithium. And if we're going to play this climate change game, I want to own lithium. And now, you know, we've got, you know, a huge spread between our cost basis and, 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 the, and the price of the company. Yeah, it's a still it's still extremely overvalued, but I've got room to let it pull back now to where I can either add to the position or take profits in it, whatever I want to do. But I've got room now because my thesis played out. Um, a, a, another good example is, on the other side of that is that we bought Starbucks, Starbucks not too long ago. Um, I bought it wrong and it broke our stop. We sold it. And we'll come back to it later. I still like the company, but we paid, we paid the wrong price for it at the wrong time. And so we took it out of the portfolio so that that weed doesn't wind up taking over our portfolio. So again, you know, always trade everything first. Okay, um, Bitcoin. <laughs> I own, personally, full disclosure, I personally own Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I'm running an experiment because I'm trying to learn um, a bit about it and, and what technical signals it responds to and those type of things. So we have a lot of questions from clients that want to own Bitcoin. Um, you know, you've got to be very careful with it because it is extremely volatile. As, as you saw this year, Bitcoin fell 50%. It's up 100% from the lows. I mean, you know, that type of volatility is, is, is hard to deal with in terms of managing money. You know, is there a long term future for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Yeah, I don't know what it's going to be. You know, the, the whole idea of cryptocurrency initially was that it was all about the blockchain behind it. We were going to have all these connections in the world. We we're going to be able to do real estate, and banking and everything else. And we could just basically eliminate the banks because because Richard and I through blockchain, we could execute transactions back and forth. We don't even need a bank anymore. Wall Street hates that idea. <laughs> so. But that was the idea of Bitcoin, uh, of, of blockchain. But that nobody's really adopted to any great degree that use of blockchain just yet. We really are just speculating on this whole idea of Bitcoin. You know, look, we're seeing a lot of scams pop up. And, you know, the, the Squid Game coin, that was a complete scam. People lost millions of dollars in that, that whole deal. Um, and interesting people issue coins that really don't even have a network behind them and no real purpose of them. Uh, Dogecoin was a joke is a good example, and people are trading that as if it's a real currency, but there's nothing behind it. It's not going to ultimately develop into anything other than a speculative asset. So, you know, the reason I own Bitcoin and Ethereum is because, again, I'm trying to learn uh, how to trade these things, you know, find out what signals work, what, what, what methodologies work behind them, because the fundament, there's no real fundamental value to these things, right? There's, there's no earnings, there's no dividend yield, there's no nothing, right? It's literally trading speculative pieces of digital of tokens. 
And I think Richard made a good point about this today. We shouldn't call them coins because they're not really currency. They're a representation of currency. And what I mean by that is, is that if you want to go to, to Starbucks to buy something with your Bitcoin, you've got to convert it back into dollars first before you can actually spend it. So, you know, this is, and, and this is the way it's, it's going to work for a while. Now, eventually, will we get to the point that this becomes a very adopted, you know, type of transaction and, and every business you go to, you can actually buy stuff directly with Bitcoin? Yeah, we're probably going to get there. In fact, we're, we're starting to make inroads in that direction. The big question becomes at what point does the federal government and the IRS step in and say, hey, um, we want control of this. And those those waves are already starting. Uh, just recently, um, ProFunds issued a Bitcoin ETF. It was the first authorized Bitcoin futures-based ETF. Now, this is an ETF that trades on the futures of Bitcoin. That ETF is vastly underperforming the actual value of Bitcoin because those options have to be rolled. And every time you roll those options, you wind up losing money. So there's a widening spread between uh, BITO, which is the ETF, and actual Bitcoin itself. Now, here's the interesting part about this. The SEC approved the issuance of a Bitcoin futures ETF. Yesterday, they declined the issuance of an actual spot Bitcoin ETF. Now, this Bitcoin, this ETF would have actually owned the Bitcoin. They would have owned the spot value of Bitcoin in the ETF. And the SEC said, no, you can't issue that. Why did the SEC say you can't issue a Bitcoin ETF, but you can issue a Bitcoin futures ETF? Well, because the SEC has regulatory control over the futures market, they have no regulatory control over the actual Bitcoin market, which makes it more susceptible to scams and criminal activity. So, and so the point is, is that at some point, there is going to be pressure from Wall Street through the SEC to get con regulatory control over Bitcoin so that Wall Street can issue product on Bitcoin. And let me, let's, let's not hash any type of mentality here. Wall Street wants to sell you product. The reason that we have a record level issuance of SPACs, the, re the reason we have a record issuance of IPOs is because you're demanding it. You as a consumer is demanding, I, I'm, I wanna put money into to Rivian and to you know, all these other companies, give it to me. And Wall Street's going, okay, these companies don't make any money, but here you go. Please give me your money and I'll give you shares of this company. We have more IPOs now than ever on record that are being issued with no earnings and no revenue. And in a lot of cases, no business model. But the reason that we're having that massive issuance of all these things is because you as the investor are demanding to get into it. And you'll pay a high price for this down the road, but that's how Wall Street works. And ultimately, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin, Wall Street will demand regulatory control over Bitcoin so they can issue and sell you product. We'll piggyback that with inflation and housing. Obviously housing market's been hot. Everybody's concerned with inflation long-term also, you know, people want to move and people are moving. What's the overall impact? And I think, you know, we need to think short term. The average home buyer stays in a home for seven years. You need to think about how long you're going to be in something uh, because we are paying higher prices, but you're also selling at a higher price as well. What's the overall impact that we see here? Well, you know, housing is always a, a, an interesting thing because, again, if I'm going to buy a house, the, the average time that people own a house is seven years. So if I'm going to buy a house, um, I'm going to live in it and it's my place of residence. I really don't care what I pay for it. Right. I mean, as long as, as you know, it's, and especially if this is your end of life house, right. This is the last house you're ever going to live in. Okay. Let's just be clear. Your kids don't want your house. So don't ever buy a house thinking you're going to give it to your kids. They don't want it. Um, but you know, if this is your end of life house. It doesn't matter what you pay for it. Cause you're going to live there until you die. You know, let's be clear about houses. Houses are not an investment. You should never look at a house as an investment and you lose money in a house. Almost every time you own a house, you actually, if you go back and calculate your taxes, your homeowner's expenses, all your maintenance, repairs, upkeep, everything else you had to do to the house. And if you roll all that back into the house, you really didn't make money on the house. You probably actually lost money in a lot of cases. But, you know, we as, an, as people, we anchor. I bought this house for $100,000 and I sold it for $150,000. I'm a genius. I made 50 grand on my house. You really didn't. 
but that's how we anchor. We anchor on the buy and the sell. And, and you ask anybody, what was the first house that you ever owned? What'd you pay for it? Everybody knows that, right? I mean, pretty much everybody can tell you every house they ever bought and what they paid for it and what they sold for um, because they're big numbers. These are big life events. We remember those things. But you know, when it comes to you know, the future of, of houses, if you're buying it to live in it, you know, I just pretty much don't, don't even think about it. Just you know, buy something you can afford and live in and manage. Now, if you're buying rental properties, you're buying investment properties, it's all about the profit margin, right? Can you buy the house? Can you get it into a renter? Can you get somebody in there? Can you make money on it? And can you sell it at a higher price? Um, that is probably near the end of the game. Um, we're already starting to see some problems on the rise and Zillow is a good example of this. They just got, they just got bushwhacked trying to get into the middle of the game and flip houses. And they found out how bad of an idea that was. Um, that's going to cost them about $3 billion on their bottom line when that's all said and done, if not more. Um, but again, you know, you know, it's all about your approach to what you're doing with houses and what the purpose of the house is. And if it's a pure investment, then you know that's fine and you can probably make some money with it here for the next couple of years maybe but as as you saw in 2007 it can change very quickly and what causes that to change that's when the fed start hiking rates that's going to start in june of next year if not sooner so i would say you're closer to the end game on housing right now in real estate than the beginning because it's all about whether interest rates are zero or not zero and they won't be zero next year Speaking to that, and, and we've got a handful of minutes left, still have some questions mm -hmm. want to address to also get to taxes and end of year tips with Rich here. The Lance, so inflation, everybody's super concerned. We're concerned yep. with rising interest rates. Does this become deflationary over time? Why? And, you know, looking at, you know, where should you invest in bonds? What does that look like in the near future? Yeah. So inflation, when inflation is tied to economic growth. And let's look, everybody wants to talk about the 70s. We're back to the 70s again, okay? What people forget about the 1970s is that we were a manufacturing-based economy. Um, the average debt to household income was about 60% of debt. And people had a high savings rate. They were saving between 8 and 10% savings. Economic growth was running over 8%. So you had a high savings rate, wages were rising with economic growth, and you had inflation going up because you had people out there consuming and buying stuff. So there was a, there was a very high correlation between this rising economic growth, rising interest rate environment, and rising inflationary environment, but it was actually not a terribly bad thing. And then you know, we had this the oil embargo and you had this big spike and and you know that's where paul and I, I you know looking back now paul Volcker made a mistake by trying to come in and and break this back of inflation because ever since 1980 if we would have just left stuff alone the oil embargo would have ended inflation would have come back down and economic growth would remain you know high um, but because the fed started intervening in this and hiking rates and all that ever since 1980 Interest rates, inflation, and economic growth have all been on a steady decline. Um, not, we're not growing at 8%. At, at the turn of the century, we're growing at 4%. Now we're growing at 2%. Inflation is tracking that same direction. So there's a very high correlation long-term between growth, inflation, and interest rates. Now, right now we have inflation that is, that is being driven by some artificial factors that's not supported by stronger economic growth wages are actually negative relative to inflation. So in other words, real wages, what people have, have left to spend after inflation is actually negative. So even though we're seeing wage growth, it's actually declining because of inflation. This leads to much slower economic growth. So next year, as the Fed starts trying to hike rates, we start tapering liquidity and, and inflation remains high, you're going to start to see an economic contraction. That's going to lead to deflationary pressures in the market. So you know, you want to own bonds going. So if, if, if I was looking into next year, which we're doing now and trying to figure that out, um, there's a very high probability that 20 and 30 year treasury bonds will outperform the stock market next year. So Rich, I know you've been waiting quietly for, for this moment, this very <laughs> moment. Um, taxes, right? We've had such a big talk on taxes. We've had many drop dead dates that they've said, hey, it's going to be done by this date, this date, this date. We're going to do retroactive potentially. Um, it looks like we're going to get a potential skeleton of the initial bill. What are some end of year tips that people could utilize right now prior to uh, you know, 
2022? And also, what are some mistakes that people are making as well because they think they need to rush to, to make some changes quickly? Well, listen, there's nothing wrong with analyzing your tax plan for next year. The problem we have, Danny, you and I, right, is tax turbulence. They come up with an idea, then they take it back. There's an idea that comes on the table for tax and capital gains, it goes away, higher corporate. I mean, it's very, very difficult for us to tell anyone to plan. Now, what we do tell people is, listen, do you think taxes are going lower or they're going higher, right? Even though there has been a latest re report showing that about 30% of the middle class would also get hit with Biden's tax cuts. Uh, and I sort of, I didn't laugh, but I said, of course, uh, you and I know that. So Roth conversions, we have a lot of discussions with clients about doing surgical Roth conversions from IRA to Roth uh, toward the end of the year. So they have a bucket of money that grows tax-free. And most importantly, it doesn't tax social security and it doesn't um, create issues with Medicare and what we call IRMA charges or additional premium surcharges, right? So we are always taught that you put everything in pre-tax accounts as we believe in diversification of accounts. Once I retire, why do I want just animal, one animal on my farm? I want multiple accounts to draw from so I can maximize my tax bracket. So, so Roth conversions, we're seeing a lot of people do surgical Roth conversions. They know what their tax bracket is up to the next bracket, move money. You know, moving money out of pre-tax, knowing in retirement that most likely are not going to fall into the lowest tax rate. That's a myth from the 90s. It was valid then, it isn't now. Um, people don't realize social security is taxed. Also, look at your withholding, right? So, well, let me take a step back. Beginning of next year, you'll have better clarity. You meet with your financial partner, you meet with your tax strategist to go over some tax planning for the rest of next year. What should you be doing uh, to make the most out of what might be coming? Um, that's always a, a good idea. Um, we see a lot of mistakes with people, how they file um, on their W-2s. They take out too little taxes. They take out too much because people want uh, refunds. Like a refund is a bonus. It's a return of your money, right? So you want to you wanna look at that. You want to fund your HSAs by the end of this year. If you, if you haven't maxed them out, you max them out. We always talk about health savings accounts. So, you know, there's a lot of things. We wrote an article at Real Investment Advice on 10, 10 financial tips, things you need to do before year end. And that's available for you if you take a look at that. Well, one yeah, thing so, real quick, one yeah. thing real quick, Danny, about, uh, about you know, the end of the year, you know, yeah. from the, the tax bill issue or, or potentially even the, the, whatever the size of the bill they're trying to pass is, there's getting to be a real risk here that they are, they're not gonna get any bill passed. On the December the 3rd, they've got to deal with the debt ceiling again. So remember uh, back in November, they raised the debt or in October, they raised the debt ceiling temporarily only through the 3rd of December. And that was with the help of the Republicans to do that. The Republicans have already said they're not going to help them raise it again in December. So this is going to really come down to a big issue um, with trying to get that debt ceiling raised. And, and the, the, the reason for that is, is that if they raise the debt ceiling without doing this bill, once the debt ceiling is raised, they can't use reconciliation for passing a bill, which would require a 60 vote margin to pass the bill. So, and with Manchin already on the sideline, Joe Manchin saying, you know, I'm not gonna vote for anything that is gonna lead to, you know, more really massive amounts of, of you know, debt going forward and, and really impacting economic growth. And he's absolutely right. Um, they've already got a real, real problem trying to pass this kind of this social infrastructure uh, bill that they want to pass is really, which is just more of a movement to socialism. And this is particularly now an issue because of the recent election in, in Virginia. There's a lot of Democrats that are really worried about the midterms coming up because there is a clear, and even New, Ham, uh, New Jersey, it was such a close race between the Republican and the Democrat that the Democrats are waking up and saying, maybe this socialistic kind of push that we're trying to do maybe isn't right, you know, the right thing to do right now if I want to get reelected. And, and don't be mistaken, this is all about getting reelected. They fought, the Democrats honestly believe that more social welfare is what people wanted, and that would get them reelected. They're starting to figure out that that's not the case. Lance, in, in parting today, what's your last words of wisdom? 
<laughs> uh, I never have wisdom, but uh, all I can tell you is, look, I, th there's two things that I have no idea about, which is one, I've got a, I've got a fairly good idea how we're going to end this year. Um, I really have no idea what next year is going to look like. I can almost promise you that there's going to be a much greater level of volatility next year, um, particularly with the Fed tapering and the Fed hiking rates. There's three things that you watch for to note that you're about to have a big problem with your portfolio. When the Fed starts tapering their balance sheet, when the Fed starts hiking interest rates, and when you get an inversion of the yield curve, those give you about a six to nine month window normally, historically, six to nine months to start getting out of the market and start getting more defensive. My concern is, is because of the, the level of inflation, because of what's happening with margin debt, what's happening with that, and the speed at which markets are moving now, that that window may not be six to nine months. It might be three to six months. There will be a lead. But once the Fed starts tapering, the clock starts ticking. And when they hike rates, that's going to put more pressure on markets. And when you start getting an inverted yield curve, that's really, that's really your indicator. You want to get more defensive. Does that happen next year or is it the year after? I don't know. But watch those three things because that will tell you more than anything else about the time to take some chips off the table and go home. All right. Thank you. Rich, anything from a planning perspective I know we briefly touched on it, but if you, somebody yet tell somebody two things, what would they be? Well, listen, one, I would tell you, if you're going to buy a house, what is one of our financial guardrails? No more than 15, 20% of your take-home pay should be going to your mortgage payment. We see more people house poor, thinking that every house is an investment and the Case-Shiller, the index, you're going to go up 13% a year. That's not going to happen. So to Lance's point, you're going to buy a home to live in for at least 10 years. That's great. But also keep in mind, don't be house poor. It's not an investment. You may need more of a down payment. It's a discipline, but we follow that discipline. Uh, it's important for us to do that. Um, the only thing I could say is that for you should really be looking at at least putting a plan together and knowing what your, what your goals are. How much income you think you're going to need in retirement. But heck, it just might be college planning or anything else. Um, people are sometimes reluctant to plan. And I understand that it brings everything to the surface. It's like going for a blood test, right, Danny? It's a full diagnostic. You can't hide anything from your blood. Can't hide anything from a comprehensive financial plan either. So I would tell you that next year, you should really look to do that. If you're with your current advisor, ask them to do it and use reasonable rates of return, okay? A lot of yeah. advisors right now are using 10%. They're using historically backward rates. We try to calculate forward rates. And we think markets are going to give you much less return over the next 15, 20 years. Now, Lance, what's the, uh, what right now is the, is the overall PEs or the PE 10 on markets right now? Was it 41, uh, 40, 40 41? It's 40. So your 40 yeah. times earnings. And, that, and that's a really good point here, Richard, real quick and wrap this up. When we talk about low forward rates of return, you know, it's, it's, and we say, look, at 40 times PE, your forward rate of return in the next 10 years is going to be between zero and negative 2%. Okay. Um, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that every year is going to be zero to negative two. It's going to mean that next year it's 10%. You made 10%. The next year you make 10%. The next year you make 10%. Then you lose 40%. And then you spend the next five years getting back to even. And then you look back over the 10 year period going, wow my return for the last decade was 0%. When did this ever happen in history? Go back to 2000. From 2000 to 2013, there were two really good bear markets and two really good bull markets, and your total rate of return for 13 years was zero. Well, Lance, we bring about this up for last for next year. You could really, it's almost like we got Thanksgiving coming, so this is a great analogy. I eat too much. I'm the market. I, I'm overindulged. I pulled a lot of returns into the present. I'm going to sit there like a lug to work that off, right? So <laughs> what if I only get 1% or 2% for the next, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to drop 40%. What if you just don't get yeah. fantastic returns? What if you get 2 3% and people are going to go, what's going on? It makes our job harder, right? Because we're trying to do better than a lot of those personal benchmark rates we have. But that's also a big risk. And you have to plan realistically not hopefully. And that's what we do in our plans. They're very realistic. We just did, somebody asked about inflation last thing. Last April, we raised, Lance, you and I, Danny, 
Connie all of a sudden, hey, we want to I want to raise the baseline of inflation because some of this isn't transitory. And we did that. So we're making sure we're monitoring conditions to input into the plan so they're more realistic as possible. Uh, that's that's the research that we do uh, at RIA. Yep. Yep. So hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. A couple two two important factors. Um, Help us out. If you guys have additional topics, please. Uh, we're going to have a brief survey after this. We're almost done here. Uh, please fill out the survey. If you'd like someone to contact you or you didn't get a question answered, we'd love to reach out to you. Just make a uh, make your acquaintance, see if we can help you in any way, or just answer your questions. So realinvestmentadvice.com as well. We will be doing more events just like this, hopefully with Lance on, or maybe not, because if we do, that means markets probably aren't performing real great. So uh Maybe, maybe we'll see you next year, Lance. But right. anyways, thank you, everybody. Go to realinvestmentadvice.com and uh, fill out that survey. Everybody have a great Saturday. We'll see you guys next week. Happy Thanksgiving.